All right, welcome back, folks. Now that we've covered the area of personality psychology in the last few lectures, we're going to take a transition to another topic that's fairly closely linked to this idea of consistencies within individuals. But in particular, in this section, what we're going to be looking at is kind of extreme cases of unusual behaviors within individuals. This is why, for a long period of time, this field that we're going to be talking about for the remainder of class was called abnormal psychology. It kind of implied that when we're looking at individuals in this field, we're looking at the unusual, the extreme personalities and characteristics that people sometimes display. Usually nowadays, we tend to call this particular area clinical psychology, and we'll get into those details later. But in this portion of the class, what we're going to be doing today is, is talking about the historical perspective of this field going over past theories about what caused these abnormal behaviors to occur, the, the, the notions of kind of what the, the source of a lot of our issues were, and then kind of transition as we progress to more current theories, current ideas about the field of clinical psychology and how we approach it nowadays. That way, in our next class, when we start talking about new things, you'll have a real good grounding and an understanding of kind of how we evolved into what we see nowadays when we talk about this field of clinical psychology. Now to start this area off when discussing the topic of abnormal psychology or abnormal behaviors, one of the things that I thought we'd do is define a major aspect to this concept of abnormal psychology. It's something that we often call mental disorders, where people are doing things that, that definitely do not fit the norm. What's interesting to talk about when we look at this idea of mental disorders is there's actually a number of different definitions that are out there that, that we can use to kind of understand what it means for somebody to have a mental disorder. And, and some of this is still, to this day, kind of grounded in some of our past beliefs that we'll be discussing for the rest of this class. So let's go to one place that I strongly suggest you don't look at on a regular basis, but it can work for us in this particular example. It's the website dictionary.com. If you go to that website and you look up mental disorders, you're going to see the definition listed above. A mental or bodily condition marked by marked primarily by sufficient disorganization of personality, mind, and emotions to seriously impair the normal functioning of the individual, also called mental illness. There's a couple things I want you to pick up from that definition. The first thing here is that we are, as you mentioned earlier, looking at things that are, are kind of in the individual. So things that are outside of the norm and somehow having a negative impact on the person's daily functioning. And this can be in terms of personality, but it also can be in a way that the person's processing information or kind of how their emotions are elicited. This is also something we can link the, the field to when we look at the definition when we talk about the concept of mental illness. Now you're going to see as we go over the history of clinical psychology that the term illness linking mental disorders to, to kind of weird abnormalities of the body is, is, is a very common theme that will pop up time and time again. This is not a bad definition of a mental disorder by any means, but I do want you to understand that there are kind of different terms that are out there that, that people do use to, to kind of define, or I guess different definitions out there that people use to define this term of mental disorders. If you look at the textbook's definition of a mental disorder, it's defined as, and this is also for abnormal behaviors, a display of undesirable thoughts and behaviors that are significantly different from the average and interferes with one's life. In essence, it's saying if you have a mental disorder, you've got stuff that's very different from everybody, which is kind of similar from the dictionary.com argument, but it's also, and this is the big thing, undesirable, not something that somebody's wanting, and, and it does have this negative impact on the individual's life. This term, which we kind of put into the category of mental disorders, and we're also going to see this also being the definition for what we would define as abnormal behavior, it really does speak to what clinical psychologists are looking for when they're trying to detect who has a mental disorder nowadays. But it's also important important to note that when we get into the field of clinical psychology, start looking at kind of what a clinician does, this concept of, of mental disorders does not necessarily have to go hand in hand with the field of clinical psychology. 
What you'll learn as we progress is that many of today's clinical psychologists don't just look for the extreme and only treat that. Instead, sometimes they can help people with their day-to-day -day issues and really just kind of get person's thoughts, even if they're not necessarily really extreme, on a path that's more desirable for them. So working on basic cognitions, emotions, personality, even if they don't qualify as being extreme, as abnormal, is a very common thing that we do in the field. Field. But if we're going to take a historical perspective on this, which is the goal of this class, we are first going to focus on those extremes, those very unusual quirky behaviors that people displayed in the past that we link to this idea of mental disorders. If we're looking for kind of early causes to mental disorders, something that used to be called craziness in many different textbooks and, and cultures, well, what we have to do is kind of take a journey, a journey a number of centuries ago to, to kind of some historical perspectives that, that gave us some inklings as to where these behaviors might come from. And many of these inklings, as we're going to see in this progression, were completely wrong. Uh, the, you know, the, there was these beliefs in monsters and spirits and all of these things that it seem to be, at least to the best of our knowledge, completely unfounded. But what's interesting to note as we cover these ideas, the, these concepts, is that a lot of the basic theories behind where these disorders were coming from are still a part of our everyday culture. In fact, you'll hear some terminology, some ideas, and some approaches even that revolve around some of these past, maybe unfounded, probably unfounded theories that we had centuries ago. And we're going to start with where our early attempts to understand abnormal psychology came from. We can go all the way back to our prehistoric eras. And that's because even though there were numerous cultures, lots of different groups during our prehistoric eras, in our archaeological digs and other research, what we found, which is much to our surprise, is that even in those cultures, they seem to acknowledge that some people's mental functioning was severely different from the norm. And when they talked about what we would maybe call mental illness or abnormal behaviors, they, they tended to link these ideas to some type of medical problem, medical deficiency. That's why many of these cultures, when talking about how these particular abnormalities were treated, tended to rely on things nowadays called shamans. And shamans were, were both the spiritual and medical advisors for a particular tribe or a particular group of individuals that, that was trying to survive in our prehistoric eras. There were many rituals that each culture, each group had to try to help with these abnormalities, but, but at the root of these approaches was this belief that, that many problems were spiritual in nature. There was an upset God, or, or there was some type of deity, or, or an imbalance of the spirit world that was really the source of the abnormal thoughts or behaviors that people were displaying. And in fact, one of the common techniques, tools that was used back in this era was something that was very, very controversial, at least now when we look at it today, is this process called trepanation. A, men, a physical process of actually opening up a person's skull, cutting out a section of it, and removing that section of the skull in an attempt to let the spiritual being that, that we thought was in somebody's head out. Because even back then, there was a recognition that the brain was a major player in the mind. And the thought was that if there was a spiritual problem with the mind, well, there was probably a spiritual problem with the brain. So over centuries, different trepanation tools were developed to try to help remove these demon problems. What you see here is a collection of different tools and also archaeological digs to show how common trepanation was. In our early European eras, even back when we started to kind of develop a new monotheistic view of abnormal behaviors that we'll talk about later, you know, there were numerous trepanation devices that were out there. In ancient digs, even in Greece, where we, we had kind of a new perspective, which we'll talk about later, there were also trepanation devices out there. And if you look back at multiple civilizations over the years, you would find skulls where not only do you see holes in the skulls, but most importantly, and this really 
speaks to the high chance that trepanation was very common, you also see healing around the holes in the skull, which implies that not only did they open up that person's skull, but they opened it up and attempted to, maybe even successfully some of the time, cover that hole back up, allow the person to heal, and these people lived long enough to have some healing occur in those regions of their skull that were kind of removed to hopefully remove those demons. Trepanation was not necessarily an everyday thing, but it was done enough to, to really suggest that most of our distant ancestors seem to hold firm that this, this belief that a lot of our problems, our mental abnormalities, came from some spiritual being that hopefully could be removed if you got into the brain. This fixation on the spiritual aspect of mental abnormalities was eventually stopped, or at least slowed, by a new perspective that came up a number of centuries ago. When the Egyptians became the dominant civilization thousands of years ago, they, they brought with them a new perspective, a new idea of what might be causing the abnormal behaviors and personalities that some people would display. In fact, this is the civilization that's attributed to, to, to kind of for the first group to, to, to create the term of mental illness, because in their minds, this is exactly what they were seeing with these abnormal behaviors. Not mental spiritual issues, but instead some type of physical ailment, some type of illness, just like somebody who's caught a cold or had some type of infection in their body. And because of this new perception, this, this notion that the problems that people were having were not necessarily only based on the magical or the religious, there was a transition during this culture as to how we might treat people who displayed these abnormal behaviors. In this culture, there, there was a new shift of focus away from kind of trying to physically remove the problems and to instead try to adjust the person's mind, try to help the person really kind of internally get out the illness that they had. So in this particular era, one of the first things that was created to try to help people with these problems were the first what we nowadays call hospitals. And, and there were what we would nowadays sort of call physicians, though there was a huge difference between the hospitals then and the, the hospitals now and the physicians then and the physicians now. Most of the physicians in these hospitals tended to have some type of spiritual training. Again, they, they used different types of chemicals, different types of rituals, different approaches to kind of try to help people get rid of a lot of the physical ailments that were bothering them. There still was a spiritual nature to this. There, there was a belief that a lot of these ailments were coming from some spiritual entity, some, some kind of religious idea. But, but the key element here was they didn't believe that you could fix somebody necessarily by just kind of changing the, the spirit, by just chasing out a spirit. Instead, there was a pretty profound belief that you had to change the physical makeup of an individual to help them. So at these hospitals, opium use was very common. There were also several rituals and, and spiritual approaches that were devised over the years to, to really try to help people in these, again, what we would sort of call hospitals, remove Remove a lot of the physical problems that were going on within their mind, in particular with their brains. And some of these rituals, some of these approaches, probably over the years had some benefit. You know, there, there was a, a focus on the self, an attempt to kind of minimize the obsession with death. And, and there were even things like sleep therapies that were used, where people were encouraged to get large amounts of sleep in a short period of time to try to help with their ailments. And there is a possibility that, that these new shifts, these new approaches, if you think about it, might have had some effectiveness, which might have perpetuated the, the continual use of these hospitals. And in fact, if you look at the Egyptian culture, you, you really see a group of individuals, though they didn't necessarily have a lot of scientific ability to test what was the cause of the abnormal behaviors, they at least had the intuition to realize that maybe we weren't just dealing with demons. Maybe we weren't just dealing with the supernatural when looking at the quirky behaviors that people displayed. They certainly didn't completely 
disconnect themselves from this culture, this idea, but it was nonetheless a very new approach in contrast to some of the more, more historical perspectives. This idea continued to develop when we got to the Greek and Roman cultures of our, of our early civilization. In fact, the Greeks and Romans still held true this notion that there were probably gods at play, there were probably spiritual entities at play, but, but they kind of added to or evolved from the early theories of the Egyptians and started to talk about kind of the body, not only the mind and brain, but the body having a major impact on the way that the mind functioned. So instead of just talking about fixing the brain, what the Greeks and the Romans started talking about was kind of balancing out a person's system. And one of the big things that they were interested in centuries ago was this notion of humors. In fact, we talked about this in one of our very distant early classes, this notion that maybe our body, our personality, and our mind could actually be impacted by the balance of the different liquids, chemicals that we had within ourselves. And the four big humors that they looked at during this particular era were blood, black bile, yellow bile, and phlegm. And they related, as you see in this picture, to some of the basic elements that we thought really dictated how the world functioned. And what the Greeks and later Romans believed is that if we were trying to help somebody who had a severe kind of abnormality in their personality or their cognitive functioning, one of the best ways to address this was not only try to look at the brain and kind of how the brain impacted the mind, but just to look at the body and how it almost impact, also impacted the mind. So if somebody was really depressed, Pressed, there were stories of different clinicians going in and trying to remove the bile from the stomach of an individual in an attempt to help them. Or if somebody was exceptionally aggressive, a very common technique that would be done to help these individuals lessen their aggression was to just drain them a lot of, of a lot of blood. And one could probably appreciate how that, that second activity, draining somebody of a blood when they were extremely aggressive, might have actually worked to an extent. I certainly wouldn't suggest it on a regular basis, and if we're talking about somebody who's got some severe mental issues, it's certainly not a good solution to the problem. But you can appreciate why many clinicians, or what we would call clinicians nowadays, might have seen some credibility in these approaches. You'd see these people with extreme behaviors, you drain them of their blood, and temporarily, until they got their blood back, they'd be very kind of sedate, very calm, simply because they were probably going to pass out. It didn't necessarily mean that we were changing the mind, and there's no research to support that this theory of the four humors has anything to do with clinical psychology and abnormal behavior, but there at least is, I guess, some justification as to why this might have stuck around for so long. If you think about how some of these experiments on these humors might have actually panned out temporarily in changing individuals' behaviors and the way they process the world. But eventually, we did start to move away from this. But what was surprising is we, we tended to really, we took a step back after going through these particular eras in the next culture that popped up. During what many people call the Dark Ages, which started somewhere around the 5th century and probably lasted to the 15th century, give or take a few centuries, depending upon which culture, which area you're looking at, there, there was a predominant view that started to pop up, which we called the monotheistic view of abnormal behavior. And it was really a return to some of our more historical or prehistoric perceptions of what was actually causing the abnormal. And in fact, some of these ideas, though we nowadays tend to reject the, the credibility of them, are still existent in our everyday society. And, and these ideas were kind of quirky. We went back to, during the 5th, 6th century, again, give or take a few centuries depending upon where you're looking at, to this notion that maybe a lot of the abnormal behaviors that people were struggling with 
were really a byproduct of demons. You know, when somebody had anger issues or anxiety issues or even sadness issues or were struggling with major breaks, and there were a ton of different causes to these major breaks when we look at the poor sanitation and, and other issues of that particular era. A great example of this could be something as simple as lead poisoning causing somebody's mind to start to decay. The belief of those in those eras, or I guess of individuals in those eras, were, were that these problems were not biological in nature, but they were indeed spiritual in nature. So we tended to transition away during this era from trying to fix the brain, trying to fix the body, and instead reverted back to trying to help people by removing the demons via a number of different spiritual approaches. So prayers became the new norm again during this era to try to help people with those extreme behaviors. But if those didn't work, we had a whole litany of other things that we started to invent to make usually the host, which was the person that was displaying the abnormal behaviors, more inhospitable hospitable to the demons or spiritual entities that were really invading the body. So this is where the concept of exorcisms became very common. This is something that's depicted in many movies, and there's still some people to this day that believe that, that exorcisms are a great way to help individuals with these spiritual problems. Less common, obviously, nowadays than it was back then, but, but there's still the inklings of this notion that are alive. There are also a number of different emetics that were invented to kind of help people try to vomit out the demons that got into their bodies. And there were even special, special types of laxatives that were really potent to kind of chase out the demons, well, in the other direction. Trepanation also reared its ugly head for a second time during these eras in attempts to, again, get rid of the demons and potentially even help with those fluid imbalances that, that might be playing a role, even though usually, it, again, was demon-centered if we look at this particular era. And if those things didn't work, well, we resorted to some pretty unsightly things to the help, at least that's what we thought we were doing, individuals with extreme thoughts or extreme behaviors. There are numerous cases of individuals who displayed really abnormal thoughts and behaviors being chained, being whipped, being uh, actually starved for years in an attempt to, every single time, chase out those demons. Demons. And in fact, there, there's multiple publications that discuss people being dipped in boiling water or, or dipped in ice cold water in an attempt to, again, not necessarily kill these people or harm them, but make their bodies less hospitable for these demons. And again, if we go back to kind of why these things worked you know, in past generations, just like we saw with the Greeks and the Romans, there's really no foundation for the humorous theory. And there's definitely no foundation for this monotheistic view. You probably appreciate that a lot of these attempts might have temporarily caused people to stop hearing voices or seeing things or experiencing these kind of mood or mental issues. If I told you I'm going to chain, starve, and flog you on a regular basis if you don't stop hearing voices, even if you still hear those voices, you're certainly going to tell me you're not hearing them anymore. Or if you're displaying kind of a depressed mentality where you're not necessarily processing things very quickly, you're very sad about everything, well, if I start giving you medications that make you throw up on a regular basis, you're going to smile a heck of a lot more around me just so you don't have to have those medications. And this might, again, give us an understanding as to why this idea, which seems so unfounded nowadays, could have persisted for over 10 centuries. And it gives us also a sense as to why some people might have thought that these behaviors, these treatments of individuals with these extreme patterns of thought and, and emotions, really, really could justify their actions. Why it was okay for them to do some of the things that they did, because they truly believed that they were helping these individuals and, and helping to kind of fix what ailed them through these very inhumane approaches that were developed during this generation.
as we moved away from this, though, into the 14, 15, 1600s in particular, we started to see a new transition. And this transition was really spearheaded in Europe. Other cultures took other spiritual approaches, but if, if we're looking for kind of the evolution of clinical psychology, we usually stick to European approaches. And there, what we saw in the 1600s, especially into the 1700s, was kind of a renewal of this illness theory. This notion that people who were abnormal weren't abnormal simply because of spirits, but because there was something physically wrong with them. And this was something that really sprung up as we were starting to recognize other types of illness ideas. You know, the, the impact of, say, poor sanitation on a community was something that we were starting to realize. The need for, for cleanliness, the need for kind of the body to, to, to maintain itself by being in a fairly normal environment started to pop up. And the, what paired with this idea was that maybe abnormal behaviors, really unusual personality, was also it really kind of linked to this need to kind of have order, physical order in the world. And this is why the illness theory really took off in the 16 and 1700s. And we started to rephrase what it meant for somebody to have a mental disorder. We started talking talking about people being sick, people being, I guess, madmen simply because there was something physically wrong with their body. It was deteriorating. And we started taking people who had these mental illnesses, a term that was kind of revisited, brought back to hospitals. But, but hospitals back then were very different from hospitals nowadays. There was a fairly set notion that when people got sick or had problems, they, they really weren't people that could be fixed. You could cross your fingers and hope that everything would revert back to normal. But for the most part, people were assumed, once they started to display abnormal behaviors or abnormal thoughts, to be on a path to really just deteriorate for the rest of their lives and, and potentially die fairly quickly after their brains stopped working the way most of our brains did. So these hospitals were really just housing units where we put not only the mentally ill, but we also put criminals, people who had epileptic issues because their brains were not working correctly. We had beggars, we had the elderly that couldn't take care of themselves in these hospitals. And in reality, what these, in reality, what these hospitals were, were, were really sideshows where people could come in and, and actually be actually view these individuals with the abnormalities in, in their behaviors and thoughts and kind of day-to-day -day functioning. In fact, this was kind of the equivalence of our first zoo, except we were looking at human beings, not animals that, that were kind of caged in these facilities. And I guess that probably doesn't put a positive connotation on zoos. You can kind of interject as to how you feel about them on your own. But, but for this purpose, you know, know that this is kind of how we treated human beings. We, we, we saw them as people to be watched when they started to display these abnormal thoughts. And we also treated them as people to be avoided, lest anybody catch whatever it was that caused their brains or bodies to start to deteriorate. This idea persisted for a number of years, and over time, we actually got worse and more sadistic with our treatment of these individuals. Instead of just putting these what we called patients in hospitals and leaving them there to be observed, we started kind of creating these environments to help separate them from us even more. Since there was a need to kind of make money in these hospitals, these people were put on display for the masses. But to prevent them from spreading this disease, as they thought, these individuals, these patients, were chained to walls very often. And they were separated from contact with anybody, even the people that were meant to feed them uh, and, and also kind of take care of any of their bodily functions. There was a big stress that nobody should be in contact with these individuals lest they catch their disease. And 
then in that same vein, these people were treated as if they were kind of on the way out. So they were not given fancy beds. They were not given pillows or anything like that. They were made to just sleep on beds of straw and really kind of given no chance to clean themselves or, or take care of any of their bodily needs, which could explain why many of these people did die fairly quickly after being put in these hospitals, put kind of in these, what we would nowadays consider human zoos. And it was a really unsightly time, but you have to remember most of these hospitals, most of the, what we would call doctors, felt like this particular treatment was justified, that there was no real cure for these problems. So why not make a few dollars off of these individuals on their way out? It, it seems nowadays to be ridiculously inhumane, but I'm sure there were a number of doctors back then, back then who felt like their work was justifiable, that it, that it made sense to do what they did. Fortunately for us, we, we nowadays do not have this philosophy, this approach to the mentally ill. And we can attribute a lot of the transition from where we were then to where we are now to a man named Philippe Pennell, who was a very, very important figure near the end of his life. In the 1700s, there was still this pervasive idea that the mentally ill had some physical ailment that could be never cured and, more importantly, could potentially spread, so we had to keep these people separate. Well, as Pinel started to grow in the ranks at France, in particular in the Parisian hospital system, he kept seeing case study after case study, example after example, that these notions of mental illnesses being easily spreadable, uh, of the, the need for people kind of uh, being separated from everybody, the, the need for individuals to, to kind of just have the basics and, and nothing more, seem unfounded. And, and what Pinnell started to do was question whether or not our belief of mental illness was, was really founded in anything but just general ideas that had never been tested. What Pinnell started to argue was that when we were talking about these bodily problems, maybe it wasn't the same as somebody catching a cold, looking at the causes to disorders, and instead, maybe it was the result of some physical change to a person's brain. This led us to something that was called somatogenic hypothesis, this notion that depression, anxiety issues, schizophrenia, breaks from reality, weren't necessarily because of some bug, but because the person's brain, for some reason or another, started to deteriorate. The connections started to, to not work the same way they do for well, a person that doesn't display these abnormal thoughts or behaviors. And because of this new belief, and because of some pretty convincing evidence that his belief was founded in something more scientific than our past views, Fennell started really pushing Parisian hospital systems to reform their approach to these individuals in these hospitals. He requested that all of them be unchained, all of them be given the ability to, to shower, to bathe, to, to actually be able to urinate and defecate in, in a place that, that wasn't right next to where they were sleeping. And when he started to proposed this, he met a lot of backlash. There were lots of people that, that proposed that he was, in essence, going to cause the downfall of France by exposing the entire country to these individuals that had caught these bugs. In fact, a famous quote that was said to Pinel is listed on this slide, where somebody in the Parisian hospital system told him, citizen, are you mad yourself that you want to unchain these animals? And it really speaks to kind of the past perspective that Pinel had to fight. But over the years, in the late 1700s and early 1800s, his philosophy, his idea, started becoming more commonplace not only in France, but around the world. And as Europe started to change its perspective, we started to see really a revolution in our understanding of what the cause of mental disorders was and, and how, more importantly, we might be able to help people with these abnormal thoughts or abnormal approaches to the world.
What Pinnell eventually led us to was to create kind of hospitals that we think of nowadays when we talk about clinical psychology. There still was this notion that you could maybe catch certain disorders or certain problems. So people in these hospitals were treated much more tentatively than we usually treat people nowadays when they display quirky behaviors or abnormal thoughts. But there was definitely a transition during this time. And what also changed during this era was this belief that these people were just kind of destined to never be able to recover. As Pinnell's idea started to become more mainstream, people became shocked at how some individuals who we thought were destined to never be able to recover, to never be able to kind of get out of the problems that they had, started to regain their functioning, started to be able to operate on a normal level. Very few people were kind of unscarred by some of the things that they'd been exposed to, but there was this recognition that as people started to be treated more humanely, as people started to go through these different talk therapies that were becoming more mainstream through a number of different perspectives that were popping up, the, the, the change in people's functioning, the, the fact that some individuals recovered, really did get us to reconsider what it meant for somebody to be what we still call mentally ill, but, but more appropriately, kind of somebody that displayed what we would call abnormal behaviors. And, and this verbal interaction, this attempt to try to help somebody without the terror, without the worry uh, of their mental illness being caught or spreading, started to become more commonplace. And, and the attempts to cure people really became the goal instead of just the attempts to kind of separate people from the masses. As was mentioned in the last few slides, Pinnell's ideas were revolutionary at the time. It got us to reconsider a lot of the things that were just presumed to be true for almost a thousand years in the field of, I guess, what we would call clinical psychology or abnormal psychology. But it wasn't something that just came strictly out of Pinnell's ideas. There was an abundant amount of research that was starting to pop up all over the world that suggested that, that this monotheistic view just made no sense. One of the biggest tells that this perception of mental illness that we had had in the past was completely unfounded was the recognition that, that many hospitals were coming to that these individuals that were displaying abnormal behaviors didn't seem to be spreading disease. The people that were cleaning up after them, the people that were seeing them in these hospitals, family members that would insist on visiting the people that had been locked up, not increase their chances uh, of getting sick, mentally ill, by being exposed to people that were in really in hospitable environments. And that lack of the spread of these what we call diseases really spoke to the notion that we, at that time, during this monotheistic era, didn't really have a clear grasp as to what was causing different problems. Another thing that started to be easily recognizable is that not all people were equally likely to struggle with mental disorders. When people were under a large amount of stress or they had major setbacks in their life, these same people seem to have a proclivity for developing different types of mental abnormalities. And what we also saw for the very first time in these early eras was that we could have some sense of who would have a higher chance of developing a specific mental abnormality just by looking at parents and grandparents of these individuals. The concept of heritability, something we talked about in developmental psychology, was not nearly as scientifically perfected as we gotten to today, but we could already in the 17, 1800s start to recognize that even though we thought of mental disorders and abnormalities as being just random, all of the evidence that we looked at suggested otherwise, that, that stress, that genetics or biology probably 
or equally, if not more important, when we were talking about who was going to start to display abnormal thoughts and behaviors. And, and the other thing that really started to change our perspective of why people were displaying abnormal behaviors and where they were coming from was some of the early research that we were starting to do in other cultures, looking at other groups of individuals, other societies. And when we looked at other societies, what we saw was really surprising. Each culture had really its own types of abnormal behaviors that people were displaying, quirks that kind of manifested within themselves. A classic example of this in the United States would be anorexia and bulimia, two very, very potent eating disorders that are very commonplace here in the United States nowadays. There's still many cultures that have never heard of these disorders. They have nobody that displays that the behavioral and mental things that go on in this particular disorder in those cultures. And it really suggests, along with a litany of other disorders that seem to back then and nowadays pop up only in specific cultures, it seems to indicate that there has to be social factors at play in the development of some of our abnormal thoughts. It can't just be some airborne illness that somebody catches for them to display the quirky behaviors that they display. When you combine social factors with, again, more of a biological background, when we talk about heritability and stress, we, we see how Many psychologists, even if we do attribute a lot of our kind of transition to Philippe Pinel, couldn't ignore the data anymore, couldn't pretend that these approaches in our hospitals during the 5th to the 15th century made sense. Instead, it really caused this revolution, this new perspective to kind of approach the field in a different way. And it led us to really where we started in the late 1800s and are today. We're talking about where we are today. There's a big term that kind of pops up a lot. The, the, the notion of something that we call the psychogenic hypothesis. It's, it's the notion that lots of our mental problems, our mental ailments, really come from the psychological, the stress that we're experiencing, the mental issues that we have. Now, we'll talk in the next class about an evolution, actually I think it's in the next slide, about an evolution from where we started when these ideas started popping up in the, in the late 1800s into, to where we are now. But this psychogenic hypothesis is still at the root of a lot of our new perspectives on clinical psychology. And it came from the work of some of those more controversial figures that we've talked about before. Sigmund Freud and his work on traumatic experiences, on, on drives and desires, and, and how they could play a role in the abnormal, really shed light on the possibility that maybe, just maybe, mental illnesses were mental-based. And when we started to look at cognitive approaches to therapy, behavioral approaches to therapy in the early 1900s that we'll talk about later, we can see why we really got away from this mental illness perspective that we had in those dark ages and, and really following the dark ages in the 16 and 1700s. There's still a long way to go, but, but this transition from where we were to where we are now happened because of, of some of the more interesting research that we'll be talking about, or interesting approaches, I guess, that we'll be talking about in the next few classes. And as I mentioned in the last slide, we're talking about where we are now. The psychogenic hypothesis has kind of been replaced by a much more inclusive theory. If you want to know what most clinical psychologists think about when they try to figure out the causes to many disorders, problems that people are struggling with, one of the terms that's floated a lot is something called the biopsychosocial perspective. The notion that biology, social environments, and internal environments, psychological factors, all that interact with each other to play a role in the development of different disorders. Another term that you'll hear a lot of is something called the diathesis stress model. The term diathesis is kind of linked to this idea of biological components. In essence, both ideas stress that we have within us, probably because of genetics or something going on within our bodies, 
an inherent predisposition for developing specific types of disorders. And some of us have a much higher proclivity for developing these disorders, while others have only a fairly small chance of developing disorders. But most research suggests that these biological predispos predispositions are not sufficient to develop different mental abnormalities or kind of different things that we would call nowadays disorders. Instead, what you need is stress or social factors and psychological factors, things going on inside your head and things going on outside you in your environment to really trigger the onset of these abnormal thoughts or behaviors that people are displaying. This biopsychosocial perspective suggests that unless your biology predetermines that you have a chance for developing something and, and your social world kind of pushes you to develop those behaviors and your mind just isn't dealing with things the way it could optimally deal with them, the odds of you developing a disorder displaying abnormal behaviors are fairly low. But if you have a biological predisposition for something, your social world is toxic enough and your mind just isn't processing things correctly, you do have the potential. Anybody theoretically, I guess, has the potential to develop some type of mental abnormality. Within that notion is also how we could potentially treat these things. Fix the biology, fix the psychology, fix the environment, and we might be able to fix the person. This notion, this idea is something we're going to be revisiting a lot in our next class. But for now, if we're talking about the area of clinical psychology, we've gotten where we want to be. We've looked at kind of where the field started from, how early perspectives were formed. Now we have the ability to talk about kind of the new definitions of abnormal psychology and of abnormal behavior. And with this new perspective, we can then, after that, transition to how this field works in terms of treatment nowadays. There's a lot more to go, a lot of interesting stuff in this field of clinical psychology, or again, what we used to call abnormal psychology, but you now have kind of the the, the baseline, the, the simple information that you'll need to understand all of the more current stuff that we're covering. But for today, we are done. So make sure you get those posts up. Good luck to you, and I'll see you all in the next class.